Thank you very much, Hazel. And let me add my welcome to everyone. Um, I'm actually on Gadigal land, and I've already put that in my chat. And those in Australia are invited, as Hazel said, to add their location, their land to the, to the chat. Uh, we have two speakers in this first session. Um, I will introduce them just before each of them speaks. Each will have 20 minutes, uh, and then we will have 20 minutes Q and A at the end. You're invited to um, ask questions through the chat uh, throughout, and I will do my best to uh, synthesize those questions and put them to the speakers. Um, it may be that what I ask certain people to do is to unmute themselves and ask the question directly. Our first speaker is Professor Michael Sherris. Uh, Michael is an extremely distinguished actuarial scientist. Uh, he actually was the founding, founding professor of the School of Risk and Actuarial Studies, uh, which he, we, we appointed in 1998. Um, and he built that up over a period of a decade and a half to be one of the preeminent schools, particularly focused on uh, longevity, morbidity, mortality um, uh, in the world. In fact, at one point it won the number one slot in the world, which is extraordinary for an Australian department. He's the recipient of numerous awards, um, including Actuary of the Year in 2007, uh, and uh, is very expert in the area on which he speaks. So I'm going to turn now the uh, program across to Michael uh, for his presentation. Thank you. Okay, thanks, John. I'll just get my slides. Okay, so uh, thanks everybody for joining the session. Welcome here from Australia. So this, this talks around portfolio management and particularly looking at the impact of crashes, but also looking at other factors related to leverage and focusing on something called target volatility investment strategies. So just a little bit of background on what I'm going to cover. I'm going to talk a little bit about why you would look at targeting volatility and then highlight empirically some results around the impact of leverage constraints, which are important for pension funds and life insurers when implementing these strategies, and also the impact of market crashes, including the recent COVID crash. I'll talk a bit about forecasting volatility and how target volatility works in terms of constructing portfolios. I'll give some results on equity and balance funds with constraints on leverage. More details were presented on the 7th of December at the colloquium. And then I'll talk a bit about what happened with equity portfolios for the US anyway, in certain crisis periods, including COVID, and then I'll wrap up. So why target volatility? Well, a lot of the risk focus for investment management is around volatility. And the strategies such as constant mix strategies and buy and hold strategies basically assume constant volatility. The risk that you have for equity has some level and it reflects some constant volatility. But we know volatility is very volatile, particularly during crises such as COVID, for example. So if you want to have a more constant level of risk, then you really have to target volatility rather than a mix of equity in your portfolio. And to support this, there are empirical, empirical studies that support this target volatility strategy through providing also enhanced returns, as we'll see in the empirical work I do. It's a negative correlation between equity market returns and conditional volatility. And recent research has demonstrated that these strategies do produce enhanced returns as well as giving you a, a, a targeted risk profile, a target volatility. And this has become more important with the recent environment with low interest rates and the COVID crash. But it was evident before this and these strategies became popular, for example, after the global credit crisis. And these strategies are relevant, for, for example, for insurers offering variable annuity portfolios where having a, a more constant volatility in their underlying portfolio means the management of their and pricing of their variable annuities is more effective, but also superannuation funds, pension funds offering products to investors that have certain levels of risk, then maintaining that kind of risk through different market conditions is important as well. But also with the enhanced returns, alternative investment funds can benefit from these strategies. <clears throat> 
So just on the theoretical background and the empirical background, there's a theory underlying volatility feedback and leverage effects in equity markets. And these basically mean that high volatility produces stock market price falls when the required rate of return on stock market increases and vice versa. So this is well documented in the literature. And then there's also demonstrated negative empirical relationships between equity market returns and conditional volatility. And uh, there's a number of recent papers that, in, including one that I'll mention that we did some earlier work on in 2018. Uh, so there's theoretical and empirical reasons why you should look at these strategies. So some of the literature around these so-called volatility timing strategies or constant volatility strategies uh, the, the early research in these areas were focused on mean variance type models. So they were multivariate and they involve forecasting variance, covariance matrices. So they're not so efficient to implement. And although some of them do show evidence of empirically higher returns than standard buy and hold and constant mix. So in a paper we published in Insurance Maths and Economics in 2018, we developed a univariate volatility timing strategy. We looked across a number of equity markets. We also looked at balance funds and uh, target date funds, and we included transaction costs, the effect of transaction costs. And we demonstrated empirically there enhanced returns and also significant reductions in downside how, how these strategies implemented. So basically, you need to forecast market return volatility, and we do it at the daily level. We use a, a GARCH 1 1 model. There are many ways of forecasting volatility. This is a relatively basic method, but we show that it does provide the higher returns and also uh, limits the downside risk in, in crashes. Uh, we use this to forecast. We use 1,000 day returns each time to model the volatility. Then we forecast one day ahead volatility. And based on that one day ahead volatility, we adjust exposure to the equity to target a, a constant market volatility. And we assume that there's changes are made, changes are made using stock index futures, which is lower in terms of transaction costs. Uh, we look at equity portfolios on their own and balanced portfolios in the presentation I'm giving here with a 65% in equity and 35% in bonds. So we're comparing with equity portfolios a buy and hold strategy, balanced portfolios a constant mix strategy. Uh, in our previous research, we've looked at a range of time periods and glide paths for target date portfolios. And that's in our working paper for this conference and also in the previous presentation. And one of the important things is to look at the impact of leverage constraints. The previous work we did had unrestricted leverage. So uh, this is a concern in practice. So now we look at the impact of leverage in terms of having a conservative level, a moderately level and an aggressive lever leverage constraint in terms of exposure to equity. We focus here on the US, although as, as I mentioned in previous research, we've looked at a number of different markets. So, so how do we actually construct the exposure to equity? Well, basically the weight that is invested into equity is based on one day ahead forecast of volatility, but we take a target level of volatility, which we use the 1% daily volatility target, which is roughly equal to the market historical average volatility. We divide that by our forecast, forecast volatility, and that gives us a weight that we use for equity exposure for the next day. And we repeat this every day. Now, we don't uh, change our weighting every day. We only do it when there's a threshold weight change, at least of a certain size. So this delta threshold weight change is we only make a change to our exposure if the suggested change in the weighting to equity is greater than that. So we use 0.1 for the tables I used later, but we've looked at 0.1 and 0.2. So this reduces also transaction costs. And in terms of the leverage ratios, as I've mentioned, we have a conservative and moderate and uh, more aggressive and an unrestricted value. So one is a very conservative uh, limit on leverage. 1.5 would be something that would be more appropriate and two and unrestricted values are higher levels. So our data for this exercise, we've used US data. So we've used the market 
evaluated market returns from the Ken French website from May 1978 to June 2020, so almost 40 years. We, we used the first 1,000 days to start calibrating the model. Uh, the data we use also we will show results of the Great Depression. So we use similar data going back to 1926 to 1932. We use equivalent futures data for the same time period and bond return data. And the statistics I'll show you will include the average return over the time period we look at, the standard deviation or the volatility, the return per unit risk, and also a maximum daily drawdown. So this shows the return over that time period on equity portfolios with the delta equal 0.1. So the top is the buy and hold market portfolio. So the mean return was 11.59. The volatility, average volatility was 17.7 on an annualized basis. The return per unit risk 0.65 and the daily largest negative return was 17.41%. Now, if you look at the daily market volatility target of 1%, we show other values here, but 1% is around the average market volatility. If you look at the bottom, the unrestricted participation ratio, what you see is that the volatility is about 17.5, roughly equal to the market volatility, but the expected return, the average annual return is 13.53. So there's a 2% per annum pickup in return from a target volatility strategy with an unrestricted participation ratio. But if you look at the return per unit risk across the different leverage ratios, the different maximum participation ratios, you see that the return per unit risk is very much constant. It's not affected by the leverage ratio. The leverage ratio basically reduces your volatility or exposure to risk in the equity market and reduces your return. So you can see that if you had a maximum participation ratio of one, you're protecting the downside, but you're cutting down the volatility and the return. Around the ratio of 1.5, which might be reasonable for many investors, you're seeing slightly lower volatility, 16.6, but a pickup of about 1% in return. So this shows a balanced portfolio, so the 65-35 constant mixed portfolio. Similar results apply here again. You look at the top, the balanced portfolio, you see the volatility is 11. 74. If you look at the unrestricted participation ratio, you see that target volatility strategy on the equity portfolio produces the same volatility with a pickup of a return from 11.94% per annum to 13.18. And once again, you see that the return per unit risk, which is now higher because of the inclusion of the bond portfolio, is constant, relatively constant across the different leverage ratios. That's important. So the leverage ratio controls your volatility exposure as long as, as well as your target volatility, but the return per unit risk is relatively constant across those different uh, leverage ratios, those maximum participation ratios. So now we look at the impact of uh, crashes and we start with looking at two quite significant crashes, one historically well known, the Great Depression, and one that put an increased focus on volatility, global credit crisis. Here we show the returns, and next we'll look at the volatilities. But here, here are the returns one year before the crash, for the time period of the crash, the five years after the crash, and the full sample period. And if you look at the target volatility of daily standard deviation of 1% for comparison with the market equity index, you see in terms of before the crash, there's a higher return. During the crash, the negative returns are still large, but not as large as for the crash. So there's some reduction in the downside. And then following the crash, the target volatility portfolio doesn't perform as well, but over the full sample period, because of the limitation of the downside, the return is higher on average in terms of returns. So if you now look at the next slide, this is the volatility. So we, we're targeting a constant volatility, right? And we know that during crashes, volatility on an annual basis, the percent volatility goes up quite significantly. And you can see that in the top part of this table. You can see before the crash, during the crash, you see almost a, pretty much a doubling of the volatility. After the crash, some of that volatility persists and over the full sample, volatility is probably nearly double the, stand, the average. Then if we have a look at the target volatility strategies, you'll see that during the crash, the volatility is much reduced and also after the crash, the target volatility is much closer to average market volatility. So the risk level you're showing 
and in your in your portfolio is much closer to the market average level that you are actually gaining exposure to in your, your equity portfolio. This just shows what happens in terms of the, the returns, the daily returns. You can see the in the blue line, this is the target volatility strategy. The, the red line is just the exposure to equity. And you can see early on the, the two go down together, early on in the crash. But once the, the volatility picks up and it's reflected in the forecast volatility, then there's a reduction in exposure to the equity market from the target volatility. And you can see that benefits right throughout the period. The impact of COVID crash. So this was a shorter time period crash with a quick recovery compared with the two crashes that I've just shown you. But similar effects you see occurring with the target volatility strategy. So before the crash, this is from the start of the year to the 19th of February, then you, you see that the the returns on the target volatility uh, portfolio, the 1% target, are uh, higher, just a little bit higher over that time period. Then during the crash, the returns are um, not as negative as we saw in the previous crashes. And then after, you see that the returns aren't as impressive because of the reduction of exposure coming from the reduction in the volatility, targeting a more constant level of volatility. But over the full period of the study here, we have up until the end of June, there's a pickup and return in the target volatility strategy because of the limitation on the downside. So let's go and look at the volatility on the next slide. And this shows the effect that I've just mentioned, right? So this shows for both equity and balanced portfolio for the US data over the COVID crash period and the volatility. So once again, you see the massive increase in volatility during the crash and then persistence of this volatility after the crash. But the target volatility strategy reduces that volatility during the crash and also targets a much closer level to long run average market volatility after the crash. So it picks up a return over the full period and gives a much closer volatility level to the long run equity market volatility that you, people usually think about in terms of equity risk. So this just shows once again the plot, but this is for the COVID crash for the equity portfolios. And once again, you see they go down to, together early on, but once the daily forecast of volatility picks up that high volatility at the crash, then there's a re reduction of exposure to equity. And that allows the return on the target volatility portfolio to be higher and to stay higher after the crash. And this is the balanced portfolio. So the balanced portfolio gives you the benefit of the the bond portfolio to limit the downside as well. And it performs uh, in the same way as we saw, but at a, a lower volatility level. So just, just sum, summing up the results for our crisis period, including COVID-19 crisis, what we see that the target volatility strategies where we target a level of volatility, typical historical market data, the 1% daily, there's a much reduced downside risk during crashes, including the COVID-19 market crash. In fact, during the COVID-19 pandemic, the equity market fell 34% and the target volatility strategy fell only 19%, still a fall, but that difference is quite significant when you look at longer term returns. In the balanced portfolio, the decline was 24% and then the target volatility balanced portfolio about 13%. So limit, limiting the downside. And that results in enhanced returns over the full period that we look at. So I'm going to wrap up here. So basically, the target volatility strategies that I've talked about here, they've got both the theoretical and empirical support, uh, effective forecasting of vol volatility and changing ex equity market exposure not only limits the downside, but it enhances return. And we saw that in those crashes that I've looked at. You can apply these for equity only portfolios, balanced portfolios, target date portfolios. So insurers with variable annuities can benefit from these strategies. Pension funds offering balanced funds, target date funds can benefit. And also in terms of just a, a unrestricted a leverage, alternative investment funds can also benefit from this. And I should mention here the volatility uh, estimation and forecasting model that we have is a fairly basic one, more advanced models, better 
ways of forecasting volatility, they do exist, and they can produce, in fact, higher pickup in returns. And as we saw, leverage is an issue in these strategies, but what you notice is that the return per unit risk and the higher return per unit risk from these strategies re remains relatively constant, the return per unit risk. What you do by restricting leverage is limit the volatility. And finally, just uh, I mentioned an earlier paper where we looked at other countries apart from the US. We also incorporated transaction costs. It's an insurance mathematics and economics paper. And I'd refer you to that paper as well if you want to see more results on this strategy using the same volatility forecasting. Okay, so thank you for your attention.